YouTube. Jeff, do you remember we were just talking right before we hit this about uh, not editing? We were. And Which not is what, editing. And huh? here, and here we are. And here not we are. Not editing. Not editing at all. At all. Because you go in with a plan. We don't have any plan for this particular part of the show, but you go in with the plan, you know what you're going to say, you say it, you get out, you don't have to fix it in post because you did it well while you were in the middle of it. You know what, Brett? I think there's people. So first, hi, welcome Babylon five for the first time. This is our pre-show for all of yes. you watching on YouTube, the unedited, unfiltered bit that we get before we get to the good stuff. But Brett, I imagine there's someone watching out there right now. Yes. who either just started a podcast or is thinking about starting a podcast. And mm -hmm. our conversation on editing yes. was exactly that. So if you had one piece of advice for an aspiring podcaster, mm -hmm. what would that be? Get a good recording. And by that, I mean, I mean two things. One, I mean your content. Get your content and get a good recording of your content. Know what you're saying. Know what you're going to go into. Know... If you're going to have sound effects or music drops, know where those are going to go before you ever hit record. Know how you're going to speak it. Know how you're going to say it. Don't stumble over your words. If you use an ah, an um, a the, uh, those are fine. Those are a normal part of conversation. But if you're just going uh, 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 to buy time because you don't know where you're going next, stop that. Get a good recording. The other thing that that means is sound wise. Make sure you have a good microphone. Mm -hmm. And and let me tell you what, you don't need an expensive, Jeff, you've got a, an SM7B. Those are $350, $400 microphones. Plus the cloud lifter you need to get any That's sound. That's another $100. Uh -huh. Plus your boom arm, mm -hmm. which is it's about 100 another 100 bucks, bucks mm -hmm. right? Um, plus the board you have it run into and the cables. And <laughs> yeah. Just yep. for you to hear me, I've spent over a thousand dollars. You yes. don't have to do that. You no. don't have to. You literally, you can get a good microphone. All right. The, you could do, you could do it off your iPhone, to be honest with you. Mm. You can get cheap microphones, but a good microphone. I can show you which one to get like 79, 89 bucks. And, and you'll, it'll record directly into your computer. It sounds fantastic good to go you have a good microphone but you gotta you gotta place it well mm -hmm. and you have to speak well you will notice you know? brent and i don't do this when yep. we talk right like you also don't have the microphone way down on the table away from us it's within a certain distance of our face six inches four to six inches mm -hmm. it's not directly right here it's right off to the side on an angle we're speaking across it we're speaking clearly <laughs> These things all matter. You know, when I do podcast interviews, I usually use a Shure SM58. It's a hundred dollar microphone. It's, it's a, the, it's, it is the industry standard microphone since the sixties. Yeah. And you know why? Cause it's fantastic and it's indestructible. And it sounds great. That's when you got to get a little closer and you got to, but it's fine. And it sounds fantastic. Anything you do off that is good. So I recorded get, my first three years of podcasting on a 58. I'll bet. Yeah. It's a fantastic mic. I've re I yeah. can't tell you. I mean, if you've ever been to a live concert and the singer was singing into a microphone, there's a ninety five percent chance it was an SM fifty eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How, but that's that's the advice I would give you: is get a good recording, know what you're saying, and know how to use your microphone, and that will fix ninety five percent of your editing things. I was saying to you, to, to me, the the phrase "fix it in post" is a cuss word. Do not fix it in post. That is, that is guaranteed. The, the, the fastest way to burn out in podcasting is to spend forever in the editing bay because that's not the fun part of podcasting. No, I like, I like editing. I'm a sound dude. That's, I kind of dig it, but with the volume that we produce and the amounts that we produce of shows, you cannot spend all day in the, in the, the editing bay. You just can't, exactly. you've got to produce it. You've got to get it out and push it out to the people and move on to the next episode. So yeah, that's my advice. It's good advice. And I hope someone, I hope it mattered to someone out there. Cause I think, mm -hmm. you know, the, what the world doesn't need is another podcast with a blue Yeti sitting between four people all trying oh to gosh. say, Oh my God, I can't. Right. And there's some excellent podcasts right. I've heard with great content. I can't yeah. listen. I yeah. can't listen to or, it. or, or this one, uh, people that are recording into zoom, oh. they're using the record feature in zoom, but it's their laptop and they're using the microphone in their laptop recording. And by the way, their camera is 
this <laughs> yep. the whole time. <laughs> like, no, we don't need that anymore. We we don't need that. But you know, sorry, let me fix this. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but you do you know what the world does need? They need your voice, mm-hmm. they need your opinion, they need you speaking your truth. They need your entertainment because let me tell you what, as crappy as the world is right now, when COVID hit, Jeff, when COVID hit, we had a decision to make, not you and me, we weren't podcasting yet, but uh, it was me and Matt at the time. And then uh, another podcasting partner I had with another podcast and our thoughts, both of them were, we provide entertainment, we provide release, we provide an escape for what we do from the reality and the harsh reality of what we're going through as this, as everybody's having to cloister at home and lock down at home, this gave people an outlet. It's what we do in podcasting. And I mean that collectively, I think is so important to the world, Jeff. I think it's it so is. important to the world. It is well said. That's why I bopped out. You were saying everything. You, I mean, this is the world <laughs> needs your voice. Couldn't have said it better. Hey, speaking go. of needing voices. Yes. We got some voices to talk about uh, today. In Babylon 5. We do. We should get to that. Wow, we're six minutes in. Get get to the gap. We haven't even talked about the show yet. (laughs) We We have to, uh, I I can't even do a cosh impression, but we have that voice we got to talk about. It is that we got more of it in this episode than collectively through the whole series. Wait, this this episode was about kosh? Yeah, it's weird. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? (laughs) I'm just uh, (laughs) looking here at my batting average here for Brent. (laughs) A little high. A little high. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh jeff you should i don't know if you've seen my my brent watches video yet for this Mm-mm, week not yet no, in fact i know for a fact you haven't because i just recorded it like two hours ago. Oh. <laughs> so. i usually don't watch till after we i don't want anything you saw or said in there to taint what i say so i usually watch that's after fair. yeah yeah that's fair that's fair um but uh but i was dude when when kosh first came on the thing and Sheridan Sheridan does his little line where he's like, this is a little preview. Hey, we're not even talking about this. And Sheridan does his little line. He goes, he's like, I think it's about time that that changes. I went, yes. Yes, we do. Agree. We've been saying this since like episode six of the whole show. Right. Nailed it. Anyway, uh, so what you guys are about to see, Jeff and I are going to jump into this. God, it's it's eight, seven and a half minutes. You've got to get to the show. Sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, we are about to record our podcast for Babylon 5 for the first time. Jeff and I are watching for the very first time. We've never seen it. What you guys are about to see, as Jeff said earlier, is the behind the scenes. It is the, the outtakes. It's the bloopers live as they happen, unedited. All the rants, all the side channel, all the stuff that Jeff over there is going to do the magic of editing and take out. Although it's probably not that much work because we get a good recording, right, Jeff? We follow your advice. You're going to see actually a cool thing in action for this. So I'm going to do the recap for this episode. And what you'll mm-hmm. notice is a couple of times I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to look and I'm going to come back and talk because mm-hmm. that gets cut together in this really nice package. It sounds really good. But I'm not forcing that last breath out to say a thing. <gasps> and then making yeah. you listen to me breathe because no one wants to listen to you breathe. Yeah. So you get hey, to see number one, n- number one editing thing, because you do have to edit. All right, I'm just trying to tell you how to reduce your editing. Number one thing I can tell you about editing, there's a cool feature in most every single editing package software that is called something to the effect of truncate silence or delete silence. And it is, it is a thing where it goes through and it, t- it detects all the silences and it just whips them out and pulls your podcast in. So if you can get to a spot where instead of having to go, uh, 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 where you feel like you're having to fill in that time while you're recording, if you can just shut up and be silent. And what you'll notice is when Jeff takes that breath, I'm not going to jump in and try to rescue him. I'll sit right here and let him have it. And you might even see me. Those of you guys who've watched this, uh, the show for a while have seen me just go and sit there and think and collect my thought before I begin speaking. Because when Jeff gets to go edit that later, instead of having to, instead of having to fix the weird stuff that I'm saying, he can just, and it's one button. It's amazing. It's magical. Yes. It's nine minutes and 41 seconds and you haven't pressed play. Jeff, you should press play so we can talk about this episode. Let's do it. It's my first time. You're a new girl. 
First half. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I'm watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon. <laughs> we did it. Now I'm going to have to cut this out anyway, but he was doing yeah. the thing. Yeah, I was doing the thing. I was doing the thing. <laughs> hey, here's the other thing. When you screw up, don't start where you stopped. Go back to the beginning of your sentence. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the first time. We are two veteran Star Trek podcasters who decided to watch Babylon 5 for the very first time so that we could search for those Star Trek-like messages within a series that we understand that our favorite show has ripped off. And we're trying to find out, do we actually like the series as much as we like our other one? And while this is not a podcast about Star Trek, we are Star Trek podcasters and fans. So there's a good chance that those references are going to pop in. So we play the rule of three, and that says we get three references a piece that we can make to Star Trek, and that is it. That is three. One of those three. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> we also make a Disney reference here and there, which I love. I am pretty darn proud of a lot of the references we make. Sometimes some Disney stuff, right? We get some, a lot of Harry Potter that makes its way in Harry here. Potter. We got a, We got some good princess bride ones last week. Mm -hmm. You get a lot yeah. of Stargate ones in that I sit there and I nod. I'm like, no Oh, <laughs> don't even know the names. Those, those might be my favorite references just because I know you have no idea, but you do the mass effect ones that I sit there and I, like the chair is reversed. Cause I'm like, yep. Yeah, sure. For you. Great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they out there know what you're talking about. Cause I don't. Well, I think people are digging them, and we've got some evidence. Brent, I've got a five-star review. Oh, yes. This one from Apple Podcasts. Club Pro 70 says, I'm so glad I found this podcast. I rewatch the series every year, so it's refreshing to have a first-timer's point of view after all this time. As big Star Trek fans, I was worried they were simply going to compare the two shows all the time, but they give insightful opinions and theories that demonstrate they're invested in the show and have really come to embrace the differences as well as the similarities. Thank you guys for helping me relive when I watched Babylon 5 for the first time. You're very welcome, Club Pro, and welcome to the community. I have another five-star review. Oh, yes. Also from Apple Podcasts, and I do not expect you to repeat uh, this name when uh, when we get there, because I don't know if I'm going to... It's um, IOGDMJ. Okay. Yeah. IOG DMJ says, really enjoying this podcast. It's fascinating to see their theories and ideas of the show change the more they watch it. I'm especially interested and a bit afraid to see how they react to all of the changes that are coming here as season two progresses. As both a heavy Trek fan and a B5 fan, it's wonderful to see more fans of one series branching out to see what the other has to offer. Some is better, some not, but the enjoyment of both can really lead to some great understandings of what makes great sci-fi. Keep up the great work. You have a dedicated viewer here. Jeff, we're 13 episodes into season two. Are you telling me we're still catching up on reviews that we got from our season one wrap up for the giveaway? Well, they said that as we're, I don't think so. I think we're through those. I oh, we think, are? Okay, okay. I think, because they said as season two progresses, so I'm guessing yeah. this is... Okay. All right. Cool. Um, I think, I think. <laughs> we got a lot. It was great. We got a we lot, a lot back. Then, Thank right? you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Keep them coming. We'll get, we'll get to yours here soon. Promise. Yeah. We're <laughs> going to, we're going to get to them. Well, I O D I O G D M J. Look at you. That was great. Um, talks about theories changing Jeff and I O G D M J buckle in. Cause I've got a brand new theory. Oh, here we oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one more. This one is a message through our website, Babylon five first.com. It's the number five, the word first.com. And this is from, we have a contact form on there. You can send to us if you don't want to send us an email direct, which is Babylon five first at gmail.com. But either way, 
you can do like Iris and send us a message. Iris says, a few weeks ago, I watched Babylon 5 The Gathering for the first time in a long time. I saw this series back in the 90s. I was and still am a huge fan of this show. Then I discovered your podcast and I think you're great. Aw, that's We think cool. you're great. I watch every episode with you and it's fun to see how you see things. It's like going back in a time when I was a 15 year old girl and eagerly awaiting. Sorry, I was, I was trying to laugh too because I remember when I was a 15 year old girl. <laughs> Reminds me of those days as a school child. It's like going back in time to when I was a 15 year old girl and eagerly awaiting each new episode. I was uh, living in Germany at the time and the series only aired a year after it aired in the U S and that was awful. I hope you will learn to love Babylon five as much as I do in no other series. Have I taken the characters so much to my heart, each in their own special way. Keep it up. I'm looking forward to it. I missed this person's name. What was her name? Iris. Iris. Hello, Iris. Um, I just, a couple of things. One, thank you for writing in because Jeff and I, we can see the demographics of our listener base and one place we would love to see more and more people join us is people who are, are female. We have a lot of males <laughs> that, that, that yes, watch this do. show. What's up dudes. <laughs> we, we are inclusive. Like we love everybody, right? Jeff, like, totally. like, I just, so thank you, uh, Iris for sending something in. You mentioned watching along with us. I have done this with a couple of other podcasts that I listen to. Like I'll try to watch like the weekly episode that they're going through, or I've done a couple that are like kind of book clubs in podcast form where like we read a chapter a week or two chapters a week, trying to read along and, and keep up with the show can actually like, that's hard. Like it's hard one, not to just like binge it and, and push all the way through it. But then like, if you get an episode or two behind, you're like, uh, and then, and then sometimes it can like pile up because it just starts seeming insurmountable. Uh, so if you are keeping up, thank you. And that's awesome. If you feel like you're falling behind though, uh, this is just like, uh, this is like Brent give out advice night, <laughs> right? So here's my advice. Don't worry about watching along with us. Just, just pick up wherever we are. Like if you have to skip a couple episodes, skip a couple episodes, you get a down week, go back and listen to one of the old, old ones because it's tough. I, I'm just saying, I know it's tough. If you can keep up that pace. Awesome. Keep doing it. I just know how hard it is. <laughs> well, the challenge here is waiting a week to watch the next episode. Like this is almost the opposite. I know it kills us. Like every mm -hmm. time, how many times have one of us texted the other and be like, can we just do one early? Can we just keep like, I got to get yeah. to the next episode. I got to yeah. see what happens. Well, Jeff, you know, along with, uh, our rule of three game that we play, uh, there is another game that we like to play where at the end of the show, we try to guess what the next week's episode is going to be. But Brent, hold on. I, okay. I, I've been holding this for a little bit. Um, I don't know if I'm going to cut this out or not. Um, <laughs> so we do play a game at the end of the show. Uh -huh. We also do another thing at the end of the show. And frankly, it, I, I'm kind of sick of it. Um, I'm, okay. I'm not, I'm not cool with you cutting me off all the time. So like really? I say until next time and I'm supposed to say peace and long life. Uh-huh. That's it. That's the whole thing. But every time you interrupt me and frankly, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of not okay with it. I thought that was the thing that we just established though. Like that's the bit. I don't like okay. it. Okay. Uh, sorry. I mean, it's just, I don't know. I, I just feel like a jerk every single time it happens. And I, and it, honestly, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, it's fine. YouTube, Never mind. this just got awkward. <laughs> um, Jeff, I'm sorry, buddy. I really, uh, I, I okay. Uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I receive it. Uh, I apologize for places where you felt like a jerk. I will not do it again. I appreciate that. It's, and I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to bring it up, but honestly, it's just been really bugging me for like a couple of weeks. And, um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll let you, uh, let you pick it up. Might want to edit that out of the podcast, but we don't edit YouTube. So there you go. 
There you go. So, and this is what we do, right? This is part yeah. of being co-hosts. We work through these things. There you go. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, hey, Jeff, you know, right along with our game of three, uh, there's another game we like to play at the end of the episode where we try to guess what next week's episode is going to be about based on the title alone, not having watched it before, not having read any synopsis, really not even having looked at any thumbnails or anything like that. And this is the spot of the show where we get to look back on last week and see what we predicted for this week and just see if we got close or right. So, Jeff, uh, what did you say Hunter Prey was going to be about? I sure didn't get as close as you. I thought it was going to be about like they're going to bring um, like human hunting, like Do Island of Dr. Moreau kind right. of stuff and bring that onto Babylon five. That what do you, what guess. do you mean? You didn't get close, Jeff. That was like the whole secondary plot to this. Hey, you episode. know what? I guess you're right. I, I, I totally thought about it as like for sport, but really they totally were just That's hunting. Literally what they were doing with the other side. Wow. I didn't. I there guess I was go. just so reading it as just like, you know, dudes like, like scoping somebody out or whatever that right. I didn't even, didn't even think well, of they had that little way. scanners trying to scope right, I know. out while they're in the middle of surgery. Yeah. And then like, <laughs> completely like inappropriate. grabbing people by their faces. Cause you have to do that to scan them apparently. Right. But yeah. Right. Well, I already kind of said it, but what, uh, what did you guess? Well, you got half of it. <laughs> Jeff, I got the other half. <laughs> I said, Kosh episode. It's about time. And my, my reasoning for that really is just, if we go by what we saw in season one and we carry that through Kosh just sort of shows up every couple of seasons and like, just sort of, uh, uh, you know, backhands, everybody, he drops a mic. He, he just sort of does what he's doing. And one, we need to start getting to know a little bit more about Kosh. And we've said that since the gathering, right? Uh, because remember like that episode, that was the pilot episode, right? Mm -hmm. Like the whole he was the MacGuffin of the entire show and he got a minute and a half of screen time like <laughs> and then like a minute and a half over the next six episodes right right so i said i said kosh um i wasn't exactly sure in what form that would take place but i mean you know pardon me while i put my crown back on <laughs> right as the king of predictions because whoo that's pretty good pretty good and Sheridan spoke for all of us in this when he said, it's about time we learn about Ambassador Kosh. Yeah, well, Agreed. Jeff. Agreed. <laughs> well, Jeff, it is about time to learn about this episode. For those who haven't watched or who haven't watched it in a while, or maybe you're trying to watch along with us, but you missed it. Looking at you there, Isis. Hopefully you didn't miss it. Iris. Jeff? Iris. Iris. Sorry, Iris. Jeff, tell us what Hunter Prey was about. The rats are jumping off the ship and the cracks are starting to show for all the president's men, at least a little. The president's personal physician and the keeper of a lot of potentially damning information, Dr. Jacobs, has taken off and is on the lam. It's a big enough deal that they've sent out a powerful chapter of Earth Force Special Intelligence, a chapter familiar with those on the lamb, they've sent out the head of Lambda Lambda Lambda, <clears throat> Derek Cranston. Sheridan and Garibaldi agree to put the Babylon 5 security force on the case right away. But they're not, but they're also not sure that all is on the up and up. They go for a walk to talk about it, and Sheridan notices a red ribbon tied to the 90s decorations on the wall. Sheridan heads off for an almost forgotten meeting after he sees that. Sheridan meets with someone apparently sent from General Haig, and while she has important info for Sheridan, it's clear that she hasn't quite finished her stint in acting school before she heads off to CSI Miami in a few years. Well, she shares that Jacobs has evidence and can testify that President Clark, now President Clark, wasn't actually sick when he left Earth Force One before it blew up, killing then-President Santiago. He doesn't have enough info to take Clark down on his own, but he's an important part of the puzzle. Sheridan updates Garibaldi with this info, so Garibaldi decides to run his own investigation as well. Cranston and B-5 security are tearing through the station trying to find Jacobs. They have these little scanners that might find him because all Earth Force big shots have a tracker implanted in them. Well, Garibaldi... 
Well, Garibaldi asked Franklin to help him out because Jacobs was one of his professors back at Harvard. Franklin is true to who he is, though, and refuses to believe that Jacobs would ever turn on Earth Force because reasons. But, like, why would Franklin ever bother believing anything that some, someone else made up? I mean, even if every bit of evidence points to it, why would he let anything sway his already made up mind? Oh, while all this is going on, Sheridan and Ivanova ponder the Vorlon specifically Kasha's ship. Sheridan is in awe of it. He thinks it's a marvel of engineering, putting the Vorlon at least a thousand years ahead of them technologically. He decides in that moment, he's going to crack the great egg that is Kosh. Jacobs is bumbling around the station. He's been on stims for days. He tells everyone that he meets how much he loves, how much he loves San Dimas, right? Socrates. Anybody? Okay. Well, he ends up getting kidnapped by a big gangster dude and his lack. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that the guy? That's the guy. That's so he was so crazy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Oh my gosh. Best guest stars ever in this thing. Speaking <laughs> of gangster dude, Max calls up Cranston and wants 10,000 credits for the doctor and his data crystal. Cranston agrees, and Max replies, Okay. But Garibaldi and Franklin track Jacobs down and are working to smuggle him out. Max comes back, ready to get the package and pick up a lot less credits than he probably could have ransomed the doctor for. But all he finds is a fired-up Garibaldi. In the earlier fray where they freed Jacobs, he got stabbed in the arm. And he is not happy. He fires off a few PPG shots. Max needs a new pair of pants, and then he hands over the data crystal. Hooray! They've got everything they need. Now, how to get the doctor off the station? Sheridan runs into Kosh and blows it. <laughs> it's like he built up all that courage, you know, to talk to the super cute girl in school, and then he makes a complete fool of himself. He comes on way too strong. Not to be deterred, though, he finds Kosh again. Actually, Kosh finds him. And this time he makes more of a connection, trying to figure out why Kosh came to him in his vision on that alien ship a few episodes ago. Kosh says that no one is ready to see what he looks like yet. And he says that he's going to help Sheridan understand himself so that he can fight legends. Oh, and one other kind of maybe sort of important thing. Turns out Kosh's ship is organic. Yeah, like way back in Infection, Franklin's other professor buddy totally guessed right. The Vorlon do use organic tech. For some reason, Kosh allows his ship to be used to smuggle Jacobs away from the station long enough for Cranston to finish his investigation and look like a jerk. Cranston leaves. Jacobs comes back and says the ship was singing to him. Sheridan hands the data crystal over to the CSI officer, and I imagine, maybe, probably, Jacobs got whisked away to somewhere safe. Brent, what were your first impressions of Hunter Prey? Oh, pardon me while I uh, adjust my crown here. <laughs> Organic tech, you say? Hmm. A, a bit of that, yes. I believe that was, was that last week or two weeks ago? I don't remember. Very recently, yep. It mm -hmm. was very recently. Um... Jeff, I don't know how you felt about this episode. I loved this episode. Really? This was a great episode for a season that has been marked mostly by down episodes for us both. This one, this one's a high point. Like this is easily a, a you know, this is definitely a top fiver for me, maybe even wow. a top three -er. Um, I had so much fun with this episode. The whole Kosh stuff, diving into it, it didn't necessarily answer. Well, it did answer some questions, mm -hmm. but those questions led to more questions, which, again, you're moving the ball down the field. I'm not circling around the same what the heck is Kosh drain uh, more. Like, we're seeing more of him, and we're getting more uh, of, of these pieces. And as you said, you said so beautifully, Sheridan spoke for all of us when he said it's about time for this to change. You know, um, and then in the whole, the whole, 
I'm going to call it, there's a plot and then a plot two. Mm -hmm. Like the second a plot with um, Jacobs and everybody running around. I mean, it's a hide and seek. It's a manhunt. It was well done. It was action oriented. It was fun. I mean, not for Jacobs, but like as a viewer, you know, you're, you're pulling for him. I loved the, I loved the group that came together to rescue him between Garibaldi and Franklin and, and, you know, Sheridan and Ivanova working their side of it. I loved the, the re-entrance of the section 31 uh, <laughs> person, <laughs> you know, oh. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I love, I loved that coming back. Like, Hey, you're here. And this is what's really going on because it's exactly what we were all thinking. And I'm glad they just said it and confirmed it. And we're like, let's put you on the right path of what this is. So I quite enjoyed this episode. I, I, there, I think we've got a lot to talk about throughout the course of this episode. A lot of like, what the heck is this? What the heck is that? Jeff, I've got my cork board with a couple of dangling red strings that I'm ready to tie off here and make some connections for you, at least as far as what I can tell. And, uh, yeah, that's how I felt about this episode. I'm really high on this episode. How about you? I liked this episode. I'm not nearly as high on it as you are though. Really? Yeah. Like it was really, it was okay. I think, and okay. I think for me, and this isn't fair, right? I'm sure like the story was great. I'm mm -hmm. so excited. So excited. We got some kosh. I mean, and just some insight into the Vorlon long overdue. Yeah. And even though it's still like cryptic, you know, it's still very cautious. Everything mm -hmm. he said, there's a path forward and I have some red yarn to add to your border. Maybe it's the same, just based mm -hmm. on so much of the stuff that, that Kosh said. Yeah. I also have a lot of questions about like how much of it is stuff they're having to repurpose from Sinclair to Sheridan and how mm -hmm. they're kind of ma going to maneuver around that. Yeah. But I'm sure it will be, it will be great. Um, the Jacob stuff was uh, to me, I mean, it was fun a little bit, but it, there were some, some holes. I think Babylon five security looked pretty inept in a lot of spots <laughs> doing what they were doing. And, and it's just like, okay, I, I'm glad it confirmed, you know, pretty much what we all already knew, but also it was a, it was a lot of screen time to do that. And what, and, and so the things that killed it for me overall though, were the, the, the acting just, I couldn't, I couldn't with the guest acting, um, the Socrates dude just, there's a reason that they didn't have him speak a lot in Bill and Ted's, I think. Oh, he, yeah. He just, I mean, I didn't buy, he looked like a bumbling idiot. It's like he'd never been out in the real world before. It's like he lived his whole life, you know, in like in an asylum and just got out and was like, how do I communicate with a shopkeeper? And I, and I get it. He was on stims, you know, the whole time, but I just yeah. didn't buy it. The See, that, I mean, just, just to respond to that, I didn't notice that at all. Really? Like versus Liana Kimmer. Remember her? Oh yeah. I'll never forget. Liana. Yeah. Like every word she spoke, you're like, are you reading this off a cue card? You are so stiff. This is not, I didn't pick that up on this guy at all. Really? Like, like, this and then was... you had the opposite of Jinxo, right? Mm -hmm. Who's like so overplaying it or, or, or what's the, the dude with the scar on his face? Oh my, um, Ben Zane. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. they're so overplaying it like that. Like this guy was just, he was going through his lines and he was on stems. Like it, it, it didn't, it, I didn't catch that. I might the next time I watch it, but I, I was fine with it. I thought he was great. It's definitely a step up from anything in the first season. I guess, you know, it's not like David Warner, you know, this is a step up but, in a lot of things in the second, season. even in the second season. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the, the general Hague girl, the one who goes on to be in yeah. the CSI Miami in a while, like, Oh, I mean, just, I, I think between her and then the, the Cranston guy, they, they just, anyone who comes from earth force at this point mm -hmm. is just so such an archetype, you know, yeah. like I'm here to, because you're going to win for the good guys. And it's very important that we do these things, Sheridan. And for mm -hmm. like her, she was so wooden and stiff. And then for him to be Bruce Boxleitner, you know, and be Sheridan and be cool. He's like, wait, you want some mayo with that too? Like. The, the whole jiving between their styles just didn't, yeah, didn't work for me. But the thing that killed, like, immediately set me on the wrong path for this whole episode mm -hmm. is one of the first lines in the whole thing. Sheridan and Ivanova are walking towards Kasha's ship. Yeah. And he's like, it's beautiful. It's amazing. 
and on my screen, <laughs> I don't know if this is because they upscaled it or what, but I literally have like this yellow, green, black blur that, yeah, I mean, I get it. it. Was, they, You're acting, but oh. yeah, I, I mean, clearly they're in a green screen. Clearly they tried to CG this mm -hmm. pre toy story. Yeah. You know, like we're not quite there yet. This is a shoestring budget on TV. Now, somebody out there is saying these were the first people to put CG on TV. That's a big deal. You know, you know what? There's a reason no one else had done it. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't ready for prime time. They've done a great job. Babylon five station looks better. Star Furies look amazing. Yeah. The ships that are yeah. coming, but like for an up close, intimate scene like that, all the way to where it like kind yeah. of morphed into writing. Yeah. Not ready. Yeah. Not ready. It, it really is one of those. Cause didn't they say that they went in and remastered the effects and stuff? I think so. I think so. They must've missed this one. Because there's a lot of the effects that are actually really well done. Mm -hmm. You're right. I'll give it to you. This, I mean, this one looked like they were standing in a green screen room. Yeah. The whole way. It, it really did. It didn't take me out of the episode. Like, because I think in my head, I'm like, okay, this is nineties. Like in my <laughs> head, I just knew that. And you know what it is? Like you forgive that sort of stuff when you're as old as we are. Right. Like, yeah. You know, our parents forgave all the styrofoam rocks that fell on 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 anything that anybody happened. back yeah. in the day and you know the old gun smoke and the -ting, -ting. you're like that's not what a gun sounds like like they forgave all that so we're gonna forgive or i can forgive really shoddy cgi effects yeah it just i don't know it pulled me out and it made it hard for me to to get especially when that ship was such a key part to the resolution of everything and it's like mm -hmm. ah, god it just doesn't look good and i don't it's not that it doesn't not even that it doesn't look good but it's not even up to the caliber of the other cg other around yeah. it so i mean i think they might have missed that one in there yeah <laughs> they're upscaling can we talk about the ship yeah i mean and, and i think honestly just everything having to do with kosh so they're saying we got to find out more about Kosh. Here's the ship. He's only taken it out two or three times since he's been on the station. That's just to go home. They don't know what's going on with it. Um, I wrote this, Jeff. Okay. I, I'm. I paused the video and I and I wrote this down during this opening scene. I want to read my notes to you. Okay. Here's what I wrote. I said last week, maybe two weeks ago, I don't remember. I said that the shadows are this organic tech thing that we saw from season one, that episode infection. And we've seen them be super powerful and take out civilizations in a blink of an eye. Just gone, right? We've also seen Kosh tell Morden, these ones aren't for you as if they're speaking like equals, right? We've also seen Kosh being super powerful, like what he did with Deathwalker, where just a swat of his hand obliterated that person, right? Mm -hmm. Kosh operates as if he is above everyone, right? Get out your red string, Jeff. Okay, here we go. Here we go. You ready? What if, what if the Vorlon and the Shadows are both part of the organic tech thing? What if they are both two sides of one coin? What if they are <gasps> the prophets and the paw race? Oh, wow. I have the same piece of yarn yeah. where I didn't go that far. Mine was just, they are from the same group, the mm -hmm. same everything. One splintered towards the side of evil, one splintered to the side of uh -huh. what we're assuming is good. Right. Because right. I think what, what Babylon 5 has taught me, mm -hmm. it's not a binary good or evil sort of a thing. So it's like shadows appear to be pretty evil at this point. Like, I, right. I, I'm not ready to say that Kosh is good mm -hmm. yet, but he's clearly not as evil. He's not as chaotic evil yes. as the shadows are. Right. I. By the way, I could have chosen to not use Prophets and Paul Wraith to compare this. There is a great Stargate reference I could have used that because you're going to go into this, I'm not going to say it now because I don't want it cycling back in your head later on. Um, but there is, there is, uh, uh, for those who have watched Stargate, think the bad guys from seasons nine and 10, you know, exactly who I'm talking about. How many seasons who, of Stargate are there? 
There are 10 seasons of SG one. Holy crap. There are five seasons of Atlantis and there are two seasons of, um, Stargate universe. All worth watching. Has the ink dried on the contract for us to do that? Well, that's a lot of TV. It's <laughs> a lot of TV. That'll be, a, I know that's, a, be, that's, I, we've said that show is going to have to be different than the way we do this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, with, with Kosh and wow. the ship, I was, um, I got the impression. So he was hiding in the back while Sheridan and Ivanova were talking and he came out and like, they spoke, like he said, you know, and then it like put writing on uh-huh. there. I thought that was really interesting. I, w- I guess I would have imagined there'd be more of a telepathic link or some sort of a technological link between them. That seemed pretty low, a lot more low tech than I would have expected. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that hit you in any way. I, I wasn't sure what he was communicating with. Was he communicating with the ship? Was this people back home? But regardless, like, like, yeah, I, I don't know because what I noticed out of that was there was a point when Kosh bowed his head. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. uh, okay, I serve you. Like, yes, my Lord, I will do that or whatever it said. And it's got me wondering what's, what's up with that. That's pretty that fascinating. Was, that was the thing that stood out to me. It was like, we well, always, who's over Kosh? We always think of the, the, I'll say humanoid creature controlling the ship, but what if the ships are the ones who co-opted the humanoid Ooh. people? Uh, well, the tech itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, uh, because Kosh is maybe an energy based life form or something. That's my best guess is Kosh is an energy based life form. What if, what if Kosh is the ship? And like the encounter suit, like they're one thing. And that writing piece was maybe like you said, him like some communique back and forth to the home world or something. Maybe, maybe not. Cause f- like, uh, what was his name? Dr. Kyle saw him. Well, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe because yeah, I mean, no, Dr. Kyle saw Kosh in his full glory, which is what we assumed the lens saw right before she went into her little chrysalis cocoon thing. And then Kosh very bluntly told Sheridan you are not ready to see no yeah. one here is ready to see what I am. Delenn is the exception to the rule. Mm. Apparently. And I want to get to that, but we're going to save that one for a little bit. Uh, so l- with Kosh. So what did we learn? Let's just, let's just throw that out. What did we get from Kosh out of this episode? There's uh, the ship. Mm-hmm. They confirmed for us later on. It is organic tech from that episode infection. There was another reference to infection Mm -hmm. from Garibaldi talking to Franklin where he's like the, I forget, I forget what they called it. The, it was like the last uh, time one of your doctor friends came on here, they blasted up the whole station. Right. For a car and something. Was it a car and a car and yeah, with the car and technology was like, Hey, that's a, that's that organic tech thing. So they, they seeded that for us. Um, so Kosh uses organic tech. We know that we know, we know from infection that that's a Karin, not Vorlon, right? Well, we know the Karins used it. It might not be a Karin technology, but I think Fair. the Karins are a lost race. And so like, yes, it's, there's a whole time. Me, I'm that sorry, was Jeff, before. Jeff, let me let, hold on just a sec to everyone out there watching. Please don't clarify what Jeff and I are getting right or wrong in this moment. Like if you're typing that comment, stop, stop, (laughs) like stop. Don't clarify it. This is a part of the process of being in this episode right here. Okay. It's cool. Don't be like, oh, well back in season one, you missed all of the, no, no, no. That's a part of the rewatch when we go get that. Yep. We'll pick up with that. Yeah. I think let us, let us pull threads and just enjoy laughing at us, whether we're right or wrong. Like maybe the Akarans way back were part of the split between the shadows and the Vorlon, or there's the shadows, the Vorlon, the Akarans. What if the shadows Vorlon. and the Vorlon are the split of the Akarans? Oh, wow. It all starts with the Akarans. We li- literally, the second worst episode behind soul Hunter is the basis for all things Babylon five, right? At That'd be a slap in the soul face. <laughs> no. I'm not going to. I don't know. We're only, we're not even through season two yet. It still could be soul hunter. It still could be. That's, that's fair. Right. Okay. So, um, they use organic tech. Their ship is that the ship comes out. Uh, what is the, the deal with the music? Cause Kosh keeps talking about, I want to hear the song dude says, I heard them singing to me. 
Kosh said I was I wanted to hear what he said like I appeared in your thoughts and it all became a song mm -hmm. what do we make of this and then the workers who worked in Bay 13 would hear the so a song in their head you know like when they would go to right. if I remember right and I could be I could be way off base here but if I remember right there was the episode in the first season where Kosh hired the vicar and they wanted to get into Talia Winters' mind yeah yeah, 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 yeah. He was, he told her something about listening to this. It was like lyrics in the song. Like he made some reference to music with yeah. her, if I remember right. But I don't know what that is. So my mind went, cause right now I'm doing a reread through Robert Jordan's wheel of time series, which is amazing. If, if you have a tremendous amount of time to sink into reading books, cause I, there's like 47 of them. It's so many. Gosh. And they're not know. small books either. No, thousands of pages. Some of these. Yeah. And, uh, but they're great. But the Tuatha on the tinkers in there are also on a search for a song. And that's kind of mm -hmm. where my mind kept going. I, I know it's not that right. But, um, yeah, it was just interesting too. Cause he said, um, was it in reference to the song where Sheridan asked him if that had ever happened before? Like he, where he caught onto someone's song and was, and then has that ever happened before? And he's like once and then walked away. I forget what exactly he asked that in reference to, but yeah, it was, which makes me think like, here's, mm -hmm. here's another one of my theories. Just if, if I'm remembering it right, is that he, whatever he experienced with Sheridan that mm -hmm. he, he also experienced with Talia and he mm -hmm. experienced that with Talia as a result of her experience with Jason Ironheart, right? The elevation that she experienced. So there's something in her that Kosh picked up on. And apparently that's something in Sheridan as well is my guess. Yeah. It's that Mimbari soul that keeps dropping into everybody. <laughs> um, if I wear a face mask, can I stop that from getting to me? Like, is that a, a way to, like, I don't know if I want one of those souls, but everyone seems to be catching them. Right. Hey, by the way, uh, I, we're kind of on the backside of it at this point, but with flu season and stuff, Hey, flu season's really bad folks. Um, you remember all that stuff we did for COVID? Guess what? The year after COVID, we had almost zero cases of flu. You know why? Because people wore masks when they weren't feeling well and they were washing their hands and they weren't breathing each other's air. Keep that up just for general sanitation stuff. Not even COVID. Just if you feel bad, wear a mask. So acknowledging that like there are literally keyboards on fire right now, leaving comments below. And I love it. <laughs> I, I travel quite a bit, you know, the last, last couple of months I've been, yeah. I've been I've been all over the world again, which is great. I love being able to travel again, but right. I wear a face mask on an airplane. Um, not so much because I'm worried about COVID or the flu, but because it is disgusting. And when I flew during COVID, I remember thinking, how did we not wear face masks on here before? This is gross to put this many people in a hot dog, a scent, a metal hot dog. Yeah. And yeah, like I'm, I will forever wear one on an airplane because <laughs> it's just, it's just cleaner to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, like I say, I, I, you know what it was? Here's the rabbit trail. You might cut this one out. You might not, <laughs> I don't know, but here's what YouTube gets as the rabbit trail. I was watching the show Shits Creek. I love that show during COVID. Right. And there's an episode where the, the, for those of you who don't know, the premise of Shits Creek is a family is having to stay together in a hotel room. Right. And, and mom and dad are in one hotel room, then brother and sister in another hotel room. The, the sister, Alex or Alexis or whatever, she, she was not feeling well and she was confined to the hotel room. Guess who was wearing the mask inside the hotel room? It wasn't the other three who were fine. It was the one who was sick. She was doing the good work of keeping her stuff to herself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and that's when it clicked in for me and, and, you know, like we're, we're, always around medical people and, you know, over here in my world and stuff. And they'd been telling it. And I was like, that's when I think the final tumbler locked into place. Like I was getting it before then it's about keeping your own crap to yourself. It's not, not breathing in everybody else's stuff though. That is also beneficial. It's just keeping your own stuff here. You know, the reason a doctor wears a mask when we go into surgery is so we don't, breathe our stuff into the open wound that is in front of us. <laughs> like, I give you, it to yourself. I give you five deltas for that. That's a very strong star Trek message right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and look, I hate wearing them as much as anybody else does. I really do, but just, just 
And you know, doctors don't wear N95 masks when you go into surgery okay. either. It's just a regular paper mask because it does the trick. Mm-hmm. Anyway, not Babylon 5. No, we're, what are we talking about, Jeff? Kosh. We're talking about Kosh and his song. Kosh has his own suit that he keeps his breath to himself. Um, what is the song? So he keeps talking about the song. That's that's a big question because mm-hmm. this this is going to be much bigger than what we even think right now. Because I th- this feels like something uh, they're they're definitely seeding. What really interested me about Kosh though was that final conversation between him and Sheridan, mm-hmm. where Sheridan's like, "Okay, what's happening or what's going on?" and and it, You'll have to help me with exactly how the conversation went, but it was basically, he said, uh, no, you're not ready. Or can you tell me what's going on? And he says, no, cause you're not ready. Uh, or he's talking about everybody as a yeah. whole, you yeah. know, and not just and Sheridan. He, right. And Sheridan then goes, fine. Well, am I ready? And Kosh looks at like Kosh took a moment and he mm-hmm. went, no, you're not ready yet either. And then beautiful next line. Then can you help me get ready? Yeah which I thought of you immediately as an, from a leadership standpoint uh-huh. and help me get ready. Right. And Kosh went. Okay. Uh, ultimately. Right. Like that's, mm-hmm. yeah, that's there's some back and forth. Went, mm-hmm. And then he left. He dipped. Right. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> like, he, but he dropped some huge stuff before he just, he, before he just took off. Talk about it. So it was literally so that all that back and forth that came down to well, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in my closing thoughts, but it came down to know thyself, right? You have to understand right. you before you're ready to do this thing. Well, what's this thing? Well, this thing is to fight legends. I okay. thought that was a, that was a really interesting word to use legends. Yep. Cause like in my mind, and again, people know, like I, I'm connected to combat sports or, or to combat um, entertainment and sports and all that good stuff. Um, does he mean legend like Hoist Gracie? legend like Ric Flair or does he mean a legend like Paul Bunyan that's a story or a legend like a Greek god right there's there's the legend you look up to it's almighty and all powerful then there's the legend that's just a story or does he mean and I oh gosh I'm gonna catch I'm gonna catch so much flack from people over this one because it's current to our own day does he mean a legend with something like the antichrist Oh, like it, like it, like it hasn't come yet. Like it's, it's the legend of this is going to come and take everyone out. And I'm sorry, the antichrist is the only thing I can think of right now that is relevant in our world today of it hasn't happened yet. It's the impending doom Mm -hmm. because where my mind went when he said, I'm going to teach you how to fight legends was I'm going to teach you how to fight the shadows, which have only existed in legend. They've existed in myth, but turns out they're actually out there. Which did you interpret that as, is him meaning shadows or did you think he meant something else? I thought he meant shadows. Like I thought yeah. that was it. Cause I mean, but you're right. Like it's a legend. It's in the book of Jaquan, you know, it's right, a legend, right. but, but I also thought, I just thought it was interesting because that we've thrown the word shadows around so much Yeah, that it was just interesting to me that he didn't say, teach you, prepare you to fight shadows. Like he right. chose legends. Legends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I think there's clearly certain certain uh, uh alien cultures have had these legends about the shadows that earth clearly hasn't yeah right all. like this is the first we're hearing about it but clearly the narn have had this legend clearly the mimbari have had this legend i have no clue about what this the centauri might just be so self-absorbed that they don't even care about this and the earth just hasn't had it um what do you think he meant when he said, you've got to know yourself, was he talking about the Mimbari souls? Is he talking about being able to transform into what Jason Ironheart transformed into? Is it something else? What, what did you think? If this was Sinclair, it'd be the Mimbari soul. And this is me yep. going back to the cork board where I still think that Sinclair has Valen inside of him. Like I am, I am planting my flag on that theory. And when it's proven wrong, I'm going to feel like a jerk, and but r- remind me, Valen was the, Valen was like the, the guy, holy man. He something. brought together the great council. He was the big leader yep. that united all the men. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think that like, if this was Sinclair, that's what knowing yourself would have meant. Like unlocking your inner Valen. I don't know for sure that Sheridan, got, ha, I'm, I'm sure we're going to find out he's got him in Bari soul. Like Sheridan. Yo, yeah. I think he has yeah, it. Right. Totally. Like, Cause I mean, are we, are we relatively 
in agreement that whatever the plan was for Sinclair has just sort of gotten morphed yeah. and absorbed by Sheridan just with a few maybe tweaks here and there. They have to blend like, it in, right? It'd yeah. be like, it's like with me editing a podcast where, oh, I got to take these things and meld them together. Let me use a little crossfade and some automation mm-hmm. on the, on the, that's all they're doing right now is Sheridan. So, yeah. yeah. And that's what I think it is. It's whether it's that, or maybe it is an Ironheart thing, right? Maybe, maybe Sheridan has some latent, some sort of power that no one knows about yet. And Kosh is saying, you, you got to unlock that either Minbari soul potential, or your, we'll call it the iron heart potential within. Yeah. You. Like, because the iron heart thing, cause it still occurs to me that whatever Kosh is, seems like an ascended being. And that's what it seems like iron heart did mm-hmm. was that he ascended into that level. So, um, the idea that we could, we are capable of getting there. You just got to get there and you're not ready yet, you know? And, and again, this goes back to, we've seen this in so much sci-fi over the years, there's the ascended being. And it's, it's when you achieve a certain level of enlightenment that you shed your mortal coil and your conscience elevates as a form of pure energy. We saw it in star Trek. We saw it in Stargate. We've seen it in, uh, I'm pretty sure we probably saw it in Battlestar Galactica, probably saw it in the expanse. I don't know. I haven't watched the expanse yet. Seen it in Doctor Who, I'm sure at some point. Like in a like way, it's, it's, it's out there. It's the Matrix in a way. Yeah, exactly. right. You reach, yeah, yeah. You just you reach this level of of clarity, and it really seems like to me that's my best guess right now. The Vorlon and then the Shadows are the ones that are did the same thing. They just went bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Vorlon are ascended beings from the universe, not necessarily Earthlings. I got it. I got it. It's the Dark Crystal. Where they were uh, united and there was the crystal yeah. or whatever that held them together. And, and maybe the crystal is the song. Now they're split and it's the dark crystal and you got the Skeksis and the mystics, right? And so the shadows are the Skeksis and the Vorlon are the mystics. And they are, there you go. They are quite mystical. If not, where did the else. techno mages fit in all this? Cause I want them back. They're the ones that are actually holding everything together. Like that's the most magical yeah. part of all of this. I'm looking for <laughs> techno mages right now. That's my, that's my thing. Uh, cause I want those guys back. I, I had two things on the Kosh piece. One, just yeah. as a quick piece. Sheridan trying to make the big deal that Kosh, you have an interest in me, right? You visited me mm-hmm. when I was on that, uh, the, the Stribe ship, but also he's like, I've looked at records and you've been at more council meetings than ever before since I came on board. And I'm like, oh, contraire, mon frere. <laughs> he's been to one, <laughs> he's been to one council meeting since you got here. Like, no, no, you don't get to repaint that and tell me that Kosh has been here in season two all along. He literally just showed up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's Kosh. The last, the, the last thing I had for him yeah. was uh, Sheridan. He's frustrated, right? And he's trying to figure out how to communicate with Kosh. And he says, "Dude, what, what is it? What do you want?" Mm-hmm. And Kosh is like, "Don't you ever ask that question." Yeah, right. I loved that. I, I mean, he that. like Kosh got mad in that moment. Like, don't you ever say that again? And it's so like, that tells oh, me dude. this isn't the first time. Right. That there's been a Mr. Morden out who's been prepping the lesser races for something like, mm-hmm. yeah, that was, that was excellent. Mm-hmm. Makes me also wonder is Morden, is Morden human? I still don't, I don't Be- think that he is. Cause I mean, I, I think that's been my understanding is that he's a human who somehow is connected to these people serving, but you know, you've also seen ascended beings descend. And what if that's him? He has descended. And this is him now walking around, you know? Uh, so, so that's Kosh. Um, did you have anything else with that side? Because the only other side we really is the whole Dr. Jacob side. Yeah. That's pretty much everything on okay. the Kosh stuff. I don't know that I have a ton on the Dr. Jacob side. That was more just plots. I had a ton of fun with, can we just call him Indiana Garibaldi? Right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that whole thing. He looked theme. amazing, by the way. He did, except it was funny because that hat was just a little bit too big. And yeah. I don't know if it's just like his fluffy, spiky hair where it couldn't quite fit all, like it kept right. holding the hat up a little right. too high for him. But I wonder if in like if this point in the 24th or 23rd century here that we're at for Babylon 5, is it mm-hmm. retro? Like, is it a retro fashion time or did fashion just freeze in 1994? Right, like he's got that like, multi quadrant, no collar button up shirt. That was cool for literally four months in 1994. 
Well, that was that was the in the nineties. That was the this is what we're wearing in the future stuff, right? Because that was the Wesley Crusher stuff. That was the young Jake Cisco stuff. That was the you know the civilian outfit, right? Stuff. The upholstery like, that's on a charter bus somewhere, but we're gonna let Jake wear it. Is that my oh, third? That was your third. I think that's my third. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It was well used. Well used. It was. I so I, I in my. At one point we were talking in this episode, I said that I felt like Babylon five security looked pretty inept Mm -hmm. in this. Did you get that impression at all? Or was I just reading it? I don't think I read, I don't think I recognize Babylon five security. I just thought they were whoever Cranston brought with him and they were associated with him is really what I was thinking, but I didn't care. That wasn't the thing I was really, there was just uh, this dumb scene, this dumb scene that just bothered me so much. Right. Is it the one where they walked right into med bay? That one bothered me a lot too, okay. but because I mean, like they were, they were getting ready to do surgery, you know, I'm like, sorry, folks med lab. I, I, nope. I mispronounced it. My apologies. There you go. Don't want to I'm not allowed to mispronounce stuff. Yeah. Those people get wrong. They're really upset when you do that, but no, the, um, so they're in a hallway and like, they're literally grabbing lurkers by the hair and like yanking their faces it's back right, to scan yeah. them. And I'm like, one, why? But also at the end of the hallway, is the biggest door you've ever seen in your whole life. It's massive. And right. Jacobs is like, I don't know how to open this thing. Like, what do I, what do I do? And like security guy and Kanicki are watching through scanning people. They don't even look towards that. And then all of a sudden Kanicki's scanner starts beeping. Boop. And he's like, oh, I wonder what the, and they're staring at the scanner pointing right at Jacobs. Right. And they're like, I don't, I don't think this is it. Th-. And then he sneaks through the big, he opens and, and you could see through no, you could see through the door, and I saw him on the other side. Yes, it was like a net. Yeah. Like, th- oh my god, that was just not. I was mm, whoops. Yeah, Urgh. it's stuff yeah. like that that gave me that kind of just dirty. See, I just smiled at that because I just went. It's just like it's just fun. I like, just don't want to see Kaniki look like an idiot. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Our buddy Zach. Yeah. Oh, was but that who that was? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the med lab thing really bugged yeah. me. And I never thought about this before until this particular episode, but this is something we see in sci-fi all the time. The, the med lab, the medical bay, sick bay, whatever you have, you walk into these places and it's bed, 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 and it's fully open. They will perform surgery on this bed while this person over here is getting a burn wound healed up. And while this person is getting a shot, like there's no privacy here, right? Not even a curtain. There's no sterile environment and I get it. This is the future. They've got tons of stuff, but there's not even a curtain. These guys walk right into this dude who is laying splayed out on a table and they're just, dis- they're having a full discussion of what's going on with this person. And they walk right up. I understand HIPAA may not be a thing in the future, but dadgummit, at least put a curtain around these folks. Like, or wash your hands. Like, try that. Like, before you go in and scan the Ithorian laying on the table, wash your stinking hands. Yeah. Like, you know, if you cannot just walk right into a doctor's office and start scanning stuff. Yeah, even like, if I don't you're care the who cop. you are, you can't do that. Yeah, the like, police have to stop at the desk, show them paperwork, go through yeah. the process, the whole thing. And also, I think... What was interesting too, and as they bumble in and start just, I mean, and again, just like, oh, I'm going to point this thing at you and be so, it's a scanner Mm -hmm. for goodness sake. But Franklin's walking those kids around. This is like the second or third episode in a row. He's been like training new people. Well, I I just, I assume it's, those are our medical students. I think, but it's a lot of airtime on a show that uses its airtime you know, pretty in a pretty planful way. Yeah, I just, but I'm watching that as a scene. Sometimes right you got to get through the minutes, man. There's you got to fill so many minutes. Well, and, and yeah, I think part of that the show and you're three minutes short. Like I think part of that was the scene when Garibaldi and Franklin were eating the '90s uh, cereal Kellogg cereal bars, uh-huh. <laughs> and Franklin's like, "He was a great professor. I'm going to sit here and talk for 90 seconds about stuff that doesn't matter about how he was right. a great professor." I really thought that something was going to happen there. Like I thought Garibaldi was going to turn something on Franklin or, or, or something, but now nothing, nothing really. It's just them there. trying to make us connect to like still shoving him down yep. our throats. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Franklin, we've given Franklin a crap ton of hard time on this show. Ready to keep doing it. See, this might be the most I've ever liked Franklin. What? Like this is the most that Franklin's ever been on my side. I've ever been on his side. Let's put it that way. 
I thought he actually was pretty cool in this episode. He goes in, he's, he's doing his thing in med lab. They interrupt him. He goes over and grab, like, he's all frustrated as he should be. He goes and catches this, this calm thing from, from Garibaldi. And he does the freeze frame and he's like, okay, got it. He's down to go do whatever he needs to do. He dresses in civilian clothes. They go out They're They're just, I, I, I was like, okay, I can get with Franklin on this. He didn't seem to be so my way or the highway, like all the stuff that we nig him for that we neg him for. <laughs> I still got all those because he came in. There's like, there's no way he can be this. I mean, I know that you're showing me evidences and I haven't talked to the guy in at least 12 years, but I know what I know. And there's no way he could possibly, you're wrong. He yeah, just was, but when you when you know a person though, Jeff, like it's been 12, I've known this years. guy for twelve. I've known this guy for twelve years, but he hasn't seen him in twelve years. And and when he last saw him, he was a professor at Harvard. Now he's in the the, the president's personal circle and his staff. There's a there's a leap there that happened that could change a person, but not if you're Franklin. The, not if you're here, Franklin. Here's the piece that gets me. This wasn't his friend. This was his college professor. Mm -hmm. We all speaking of the episode infection. We also saw that from the episode infection. He talks about this guy who was his teacher as if he's like his best friend. What in the world was Franklin when he was in school? The biggest, <laughs> like the, the biggest uh, teacher's Suck pet. Yeah. yeah, possible. I mean, and that's what we have now. He's not, I don't think he was willing to help Garibaldi because he was down to help Garibaldi. He was down to help Garibaldi because Garibaldi needed him. You know what this guy looks like. You'll wreck it and he'll talk to you. He's on the run. He'll trust you. Franklin's like, yeah, you do need me. So I'll come because I'm still the most important part of this puzzle. I just, I, I felt, I don't know. I just think Franklin, I have zero for him at all. And this didn't <laughs> yeah, help. I, I was going to say, I, I am still with you. I still don't have much for Franklin. <laughs> this is just the most tolerable I've, I've found him so far in Babylon five. Maybe eating cereal bars gets you there. Maybe that's the, maybe that humanized him a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about the one thing that I think you had to have loved about Franklin in this episode. Oh, Jeff, I need to borrow one. Shoot. I, still, I still have all three of mine. Okay. So, can I borrow one? Yeah. You, I think I do. All right. Yeah, one. All right. Here we go. The Jim Kirk double handed judo chop. <laughs> yes. If that doesn't give you five deltas just because of that. I loved it too. Cause like, I, I'm going to say some things about how I think this episode specifically dealt with star Trek, but uh -huh. I've, we've talked before about the fight scenes and how like they do the roundhouses and the flying uh -huh. kicks to be like, we're not star Trek, but Franklin is like, yeah, we kind of are though. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to go back to 1960s Western fighting. Here we go. That was great. Um, that whole okay. fight scene was pretty weird though. I mean, <sighs> like when Garibaldi got stabbed. Yeah. 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 The whole thing just was weird. I didn't realize he got stabbed in his arm until he had his shirt off and Franklin was trying to like, yeah, the whole time. I'm like, what I got stabbed in the, in the, 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 the side is why well, I, I saw the little thing go into those arm, but his react, like, there's nothing that could have happened to that arm that yeah. would have had the reaction. You know what I mean? I'm just like, was it a, was it a pain giver? <laughs> right. Was it, was it a flashback to that? Right. And Garibaldi can just kind of, nope, he just got stabbed a right. little bit in his bicep. Okay, can we? This is the last thing I have on Garibaldi, though. Can we talk about Garibaldi turning into John freaking McClane? Dude, seriously, right out of Die Hard. Right. Right out of, like almost line for line. <laughs> oh, I, I hope somebody tell me. Okay, this you can tell me down in the comments. Did JMS do that on purpose? Was that an homage to Die Hard in that moment where Garibaldi's, I mean, he's shooting around this dude's head, freaking him out. Oh, it's so good. I loved that scene. I, I had a hard time with Max. I don't know if you did, but my, but I want to own it. I think he did. I think Richard Mole did a great job portraying him, but my wife and I are watching night mm -hmm. court on prime right now. Like literally we're going to get done. Recording. That's where he was from. You didn't know. No, no, no. Cause like, like I even said it on the thing. I was like, I know who this guy is and I, I'm not placing it. Who like, Oh, it, oh, that's who it was. Okay. I got Aristotle you. Nostradamus bull Shannon. Yeah. Like it's him. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I know exactly who it is now. Absolutely. Yep. And he was great. I loved him in the role, but because like literally we're going to get done recording, I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to watch an episode of night court with my <laughs> wife before we go to bed. Right. Like he, I, I couldn't not see bull 
in him. And so yeah. I'm not counting that against it in me liking the episode because I totally own that's my bias. But that scene where, where Garibaldi's blasting at him and he's reacting to nothing, right? Because we've seen the behind the scenes of right, any, right. any show. Was, right. That was great. Right. Okay. So Sheridan talking and just completely faking out Cranston with downtown and sending him down that way. I, I just, I thought that was that. And then the, the, the whole final conversation with Cranston, where he's like, Hey, Ivanova is going to get you everybody you need. We're going to get you off the whole thing about sending Jacobs out on the ship and then getting him back. And you've scanned it. Now you got to leave. That was, that was something Sinclair would have done. You know what I mean? Like yep. I could totally have seen that's a, I mean, that's what you give the captain to do, uh, as he goes. And I loved Ivanova's response. Like you knew this whole time. And she's like, you didn't ask. Uh huh. <laughs> and we're not really sure that it would have worked anyway, but you weren't nice. You get <laughs> like, more, you get more, uh, you know, whatever with honey than, vin than vinegar. Right. It walked off. Ivanova had right. some great lines. Like she had that. And then there was the. <laughs> Like the first time I watched the episode, like I had to pause the episode. I was laughing so much because they were trying to, um, Cranston came on board and says, you know, Hey, here's the deal with Jacobs. We got it. We got to find him. We're going on a manhunt. Mm -hmm. And so Sheridan's like, Hey, we got to slow down departures and stuff like that. Just tell them, tell them we're having mechanical problems. And Ivana was like, Oh yeah, they'll believe that. <laughs> like, like, of course, of course we're having mechanical problems. <laughs> so we do here. <laughs> The, one, the only last thought I had that, I mean, doesn't mean anything, but it's kind of a, well, I have two actually now. One does mean something maybe, but one of them was Max, you know, kidnapped Jacobs and then he calls up Cranston. He's like, I want 10,000 credits for this guy. And Cranston's like, done. Did Max have to do in that moment? Be like, crap, <laughs> I could have gotten so much more. All, all that I heard in that moment was I want one million dollars. Yep. <laughs> Everybody starts laughing. Like, okay, sure. Here you go. Like, <laughs> so the Can episode, I ask for more, right? Is it not enough? <laughs> it's just so funny. He's like, yeah, I'm going to get 10 K. And it's like, you're, you're a moron, dude. That's yeah. But uh, the last thing, so Sheridan's in the little meeting room with uh, the, the general Hig resistance fighter person. He's like, I got the data crystal. Two things. One, did he keep a copy of that data crystal for himself? Sure yeah, I'm guessing he did. And two, she ended it with, nice job, Captain Sheridan. Here you've won one for the good guys. The good guys don't ever say that, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else the good guy, my, my buddy Matt over at Beam Me Up always said this. You know what else good guys never say? It's for the greater good. Yeah. If you say for the greater good, you're automatically bad. You are a villain. Did you have anything else? I'm sorry. I'm going to use yep. your other one. You, oh you said you had all three. You haven't used a single one. There is somebody else who said this. What was he say? He said, chalk one up for the good guys. Or Cisco, like in his big. He did. This is a huge victory for the good guy. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. And arguably Cisco was not the most goodest guy of the captains. Cisco was pretty awesome. Once he, he was, I mean, he was awesome, but I mean, as what? far as like, Oh God, Jeff, I just thought of something. <laughs> <laughs> Cisco got awesome when he shaved his head and grew his goatee out. Uh huh. So help me if Sheridan shaves his head and grows a goatee <laughs> right about the end of season three. Right. Oh, my word. That's <laughs> <laughs> then who's copying who at that point, right? Well, yeah, because I, I guess in, in TV land, Deep Space Nine would have been out for so long. And we we know for a fact Cisco growing out his goatee and shaving his head had more to do with the actor. Yep. And that's how he looked normally than it did anything to do with the character. In fact, it had nothing to do with the character. Yeah. Like, they had him all clean cut because he had just come off as, uh, what, Hawk, the show where he was Hawk, and he had the shaved head goatee, and they wanted to make sure there was separation. And they're like, yeah, that was a mistake. No, the, no, no, no. Oh no. Call it out what it is. They didn't want him to look. The, the word was street. Really? It, yeah. 
That's that's it's in the Deep Space Nine documentary, like behind the scenes. Jeff, yeah. this is quickly turning into a Star Trek podcast. It is. It I just not always, a Star Trek yeah. podcast, but I'm going to call that out for exactly what it was. It was racism at its finest. They're saying he looked too black. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. And they and it took them three seasons, four seasons, uh, three seasons, I guess, to let them go back. Yeah, because season just three, he still had the was still had the hair and then the goatee, and then they're well, like, just All the right. last couple episodes. They yeah, and then they're like, okay, the last couple episodes, and then yeah, just just do you, man. And then he yeah. got awesome. You have anything else? All right, Brent, we have reached that part of the show where we boil all of this down. We see if there's a Star Trekky message to it. We're also going to talk about how much we liked it. And we're going to do that. I'm going to rate this on a scale of zero to five deltas as to what the Star Trek message, Star Trekky message is it? morals, themes, a mirror to society. Can we be better in the future? And you are going to rate this on a scale of zero to five star theories as to just how much we enjoyed this episode. And I think. This is a surprisingly Star Trek-y episode. Really? I, I think so. I think so? In okay. moments, in moments. When they're eating their cereal bars, sitting in down below, Garibaldi says, that he and um, Franklin are talking about how the future is not all it's cracked up to be. Mm-hmm. Like Franklin compares it to the kid who wants that toy at Christmas, and then they get it, and it's kind of, uh. And then Garibaldi had an incredible line. And he says, the future should have come with instructions, said some assembly required. I loved that. So it's actually the opposite of a Star Trek message is what this was. Trek shows us that a better future is possible. I'm going to steal a concept of yours, Brent, that you've used on here a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Star Trek shows us it's possible. Babylon five shows us that we're going to have to fight for that future. Yeah. Maybe possibly at the end of this series, we'll show, they'll show us that it was worth fighting for, but Mm -hmm. I feel like that whole scene was literally like directed at star Trek, right? They're just like, yeah, future actually sucks just as much as the present does. It's just different, Mm -hmm. but I think hidden in there, because it's science fiction, right? And I believe science fiction, especially in the 90s, was built in a way to make us believe that better things were possible. So this was about showing us that it will be better, can be better, if we mm-hmm. fight, if we take the time to do that assembly. But I think Kosh really works into this one a lot too. I referred to it earlier. Core to his message to Sheridan was that he has to understand himself and Mm -hmm. That's how you develop your emotional intelligence, right? You develop self-awareness, learn self-regulation. I could literally do, I have done whole episodes on that. That's a Starfleet Leadership Academy. But the the Star Trek message here is know yourself so that you can know others, which hits, and it hits on a theme that we've talked about before, usually under the the concept of be, do, have. And Mm -hmm. that is for you to change others, you first have to change yourself. Kosh is setting Sheridan up on a journey of self-discovery that's going to help him know himself so that he can help others. And to me, there's no bigger Star Trek message than better yourself so you can better others. Now I want to score this higher than I'm going to. Um, cause I, but, but, the, but the overall impact of these messages, we're not going to know till we get to the end of the series. Yeah. So I, I wanted to hit this like in the fours or I teased five in my head, but I'm going to give this one three deltas. Jeff, if you and I were both teachers in the school, <laughs> we'd be fed, your fed students would down. hate, no, they would hate having you grade their tests and they would love me cause I'm a much easier grader than you are. <laughs> Thank you. Because I think I gave last week like it's a five the Delta series. Well, last week was great. I can't. Yeah. I wanted this one to be. I wanted it to be, but yeah. it, it just hangs too much on what what they do with what they dropped. You know, I got to tell you the the comment the the words that came out of Sheridan's mouth when he was talking to Kosh there felt like you could have put Patrick Stewart in that role and you would have heard Picard saying those exact same lines. Totally, they totally. really did, and. Uh, that's that's where I got to it, but I didn't go as far as you did with it. So so excellent. Um, I get to do Star Furies. How much do we like this episode? Now, Jeff, you and I, I think this is a rare occasion. I don't know how often this has happened. We're in two different places on how much we liked this episode. Yeah. And fortunately, I'm the one who gets to say how much we like this episode this week. 
Uh, I love this episode. Absolutely. I had so much fun with it. Uh, it gave me answers. It moved the ball forward. The whole hunting down Jacobs, I thought was, it was just fun. He got captured and then you had bull from night court. I'm like, I know this guy. I know this guy. Where's he from? You know, it, 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 they went and got him back. Sheridan's having to play that whole thing with Sheridan and Ivanova and it, having to play like, yeah, we're working with you over here, but we're also not because we know the truth of what's going on. Like I just, it was so good. So I'm going to give this one a solid four star furies. Wow. Four star furies. And that's me just not doing five just because letting my potential rating of two star furies influence it just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. I appreciate that. Well, Brent, now is where the, the money really hits the road here. Starting mm. here in season two, we are developing the definitive ranking of the episodes here in the second season. It is 100% accurate. It's objective. This is the ranking. And you get to rank this one. <laughs> so <laughs> our top five sits currently number one, The Coming of Shadows. Number two, A Race Through Dark Places. Number three, All Alone in the Night. Four, Soulmates. And five, the season premiere, Points of Departure. Brent, where do you place Hunter Prey? You know, Jeff, these are... I, I look at just the top five list here. And I think we're 13 episodes into the season. Coming of Shadows was awesome. A Race Through Dark Places was great. All Alone in the Night was amazing. Soulmates was fun. Mm -hmm. Points of Departure did some stuff, changed some stuff for us, but it was a good episode. Everything after that has been very, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. in fact, I might even say that Soulmates and Points of Departure really should be more middle of the road episodes and not top five episodes. So for that reason, uh, I am placing this episode Hunter Prey at number four, and it's going to push points of departure out of the way. I'm going to leave the top three alone because I think the top three really, um, I really enjoyed this episode, but I think those had some, some bigger, better keyer moments, uh, and, and a little bit more explosive, uh, type stuff. This one, this one straddles that line between fun, like soulmates to me and awesome because it's pushing the ball down, down the way. Like it's right there in that middle. So I'm going to put this in at number four. Okay. Well, I'm not going to argue with that mostly because I allowed. can't, that's the rule. <laughs> Dems the rules, but Brent, that's it for Hunter prey next week. We get to play our another game here right now. And this is mm. the game. Oh, this where, is that game. Yep, this is that game. So next week we're going to watch There All the Honor Lies. So we don't look these up ahead of time. We don't look at screenshots, thumbnails, synopses, anything whatsoever. Literally, Brent mm -hmm. just heard the name of this episode. So based on the name alone, Brent, what do you think There All the Honor Lies is going to be about? You say honor and three names come to mind. Garibaldi. Londo, who has some big honor stuff going on right now, and Delenn. Those three names. So I'm going to say, and I'm going to go out on a limb, that this is going to be a show that features not one plot, not a, a plot, B plot, but this is going to be an A, B, and C plot featuring Delenn, Garibaldi, and Londo. And we've been predicting it, and I'm going to keep predicting it because it's got to happen soon. This is redemption of Londo, or at least it starts down that path. Because I still don't think we've started down the path of redemption of Londo. But this will be like, Londo is going to come face to face with where his honor really is, where that lies. He's going to have to do that. This will be one of those where all three, like the, the subplots all interweave. And work together, maybe give you what was that episode? Oh, TKO. Remember TKO? I do. Where you had dude fighting and you had Ivanova grieving. Those two plots had zero to do with each other until you realize that they're intercut in their metaphors of each other. Mm -hmm. 
I think this one might be like those three plots work together. Like it gives you three different looks at the exact same idea. You're going to see Delenn, most likely Delenn's having to deal with some of the fallout of losing her seat on the Great Council and where she is as a, as a, just an ambassador now, right? Like where her honor is. Yeah. And uh, Garibaldi is, he'll be the comic relief of the episode and something. That's okay. my guess. What about you, Jeff? I love that you called called up TKO. I love TKO. And I'll tell you what I want this episode to be about. <laughs> it won't be, but I, what I want it to be is a callback to TKO, right? The mm-hmm. Mutai and honor, everything that comes with that. When Walker Smith went and went toe to toe with Gior. Oh man, I remember everything about this. Oh, wow. One. Yeah. Your, I, Jeff, I got to say your recall of being able to pinpoint episodes and titles and exact lines is phenomenal. You're way better at that than I am. And I, I got a lot of a long ways to go, but I appreciate that. But I think, yeah, so that when they go to, they fight to a draw that opens the door for humans to fight in the Mutai. So I, I want a return of Walker Smith in the Mutai, but I doubt that very much. So what I think this one, here's my official guess. We haven't talked about the shadows in a long time. And okay. this, this season is called the coming of shadows. So I think this is going to be out on the rim. They get, uh, you know, some update, some attack, some something of some kind. And this is going to bring back Keffer when he was lost in hyperspace. And he's going to be, I, I, cause he's still in the freaking opening credits, right? <laughs> he's the commander of what Zeta wing or whatever. Right. Right. And he's been MIA. So it's going to bring back Keffer and his whole thing when he was in hyperspace was trapped there. And he's like, I'm going to find those guys. And so this is going to be about his honor going out to find, find the shadows. Ooh, I like that one. Well, we're going to find out here next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. We appreciate it very much. If you haven't already, if you're watching, if you're listening, wherever you're doing that, pop over, click, hit the subscribe button. And hey, YouTube, this one is to you. We know that almost half of you watching have not subscribed. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to give you a moment here. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and hit that button. You do it. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. So hit that. Now go over to Apple Podcasts, Audible, Podchaser, Good Pods, wherever you want. Write us a review. That'll be the greatest thing in the world. And I cannot wait to share it with you here on the podcast. So Brent, until next time. Je- peace. Jeff. I'm cutting you off again. You, uh, You really enjoyed that, didn't you? Jeff, how could you even suggest a thing? It's it's just a foolish thought. It's a foolish thought. Yeah. Well, I'll forgive it. This time. (laughs) Peace, peace and long life. This more first time. Hey, hey, Jeff. Yeah, Brent. Do you think that everybody bought out there that like we were mad at each other? I don't. I'm episode? a terrible actor. I'm such a terrible actor. <laughs> There's no way. It'd be cool if they did. That'd be awesome. We planned that. We did. Mm, we absolutely. We plan. Jeff and I spend, I'm not going to say an inordinate amount of time, but it's probably the single thing from week to week that we spend the most time talking about as far as the actual show goes. Well, everything else, like we do our own thing, right? We got our yeah. structure. We fill in the blanks. We do our stuff. We like to surprise each other with our theories and our questions. Right. But right. when it comes We're really to really not to talk about stuff before. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. But the go home, like that takes planning. We got to think you, about that. You got to. Th- well, that's, that goes back to getting a good recording. Exactly. Having right? a plan, like, executing the plan. And then, and then after that, it just comes off with how do you read it? Can you make it sound like you didn't plan it? <laughs> Well, Jeff, uh, with that, um, I think that's going to do it for us. I think it is. I'm going to head Sorry, out. Watch some Night Court. Wow. I'm going to watch Night Court. I'm going to go to bed because it is late where I am. Yeah, you're Not a so lot late later. Where you are. You're yeah. a lot later than I am. Um, but uh, hey, Club 65, you guys are awesome. Thanks for tuning in all the way here to the end. Drop a 65. Let us know that you stayed all the way to the end. And uh, Jeff, that'll get us, man. We'll see you. Bye, guys. <laughs>